Five Nights at Freddy's is like a 1,000 piece jigsaw puzzle. It's hard to see every clue's meaning. But they all snap together to make a picture as long as you don't throw any pieces out. I've studied FNAF from the beginning. Here's a speedrun of the timeline and surprising story that I found. I'm Blackfoot Ferret, welcome to the Ferret Theory. Let's start at FNAF 2. Jeremy's Night 6 check dates Friday the 13th of November 1987. A work week at Phasma Entertainment starts on Sunday if Night 6 is Friday. Plug this into FNAF 1, where Night 6 is also November 13th. Mike Schmidt's minimum wage puts his check near 1993, but the closest year where November 13th is Friday is 1992, so that's my year for FNAF 1. In FNAF 1, Phone Guy says Freddy and Friends sang the same songs for 20 years, so the robots are 20 years old in 1992. This means they were built in 1972, much earlier than most timelines go. Funky says FNAF 2 is the new and improved Freddy's. But new and improved compared to what? If Fred Bear's Family Diner is the first restaurant FNAF 2 is trying to outdo, shouldn't it be the new and improved Fred Bear's? Another Freddy's must exist earlier in the timeline. FNAF 1 has a poster about a struggling Freddy Fazbear's Pizza that stayed open for years after a single bad incident. Run by a single company no other corporation was willing to help. Could this be our missing Freddy's? At Fred Bear's, the CEOs of Fazbear Entertainment and Afton Robotics, Henry and William, performed together in Fred Bear and Spring Bonnie. Their two companies worked together, so the one company era was over. Henry's Fazbear Entertainment pays all the bills going forwards, employing the technology of Afton Robotics. So their two company association lasted from Fred Bear's to FNAF 1 when we see the poster. The struggling Freddy's must be before Fred Bear's. So when was Fred Bear's? The promotional cartoon Fred Bear and Friends aired in 1983. It takes a year to make a cartoon, so work began in 1982 when Fred Bear's must be open. Funky said Fred Bear's had been closed for years by 1987, so Fred Bear's operated between 1982 and 1983, long after 1972. There's more evidence Fred Bear's wasn't the first restaurant. Fred Bear has called a yellow Freddy Fazbear suit in the Silver Eyes, a golden imitation of Freddy who already existed. FNAF 1 backs this up when a ghost who looks like Fred Bear has the same shape as Freddy. It seems Fred Bear wants to supplant Freddy as the star. Henry owned Fred Bear, but who owned Freddy? The second owner of the survival logbook likes Freddy a lot. He gets offended when the book tells us to make Freddy say funny things, but laughs when this happens to other characters. He also redraws the company logo so only Freddy appears, but he also draws comics of locking up and blowing up a character who looks like Freddy. The red ink doesn't reveal their color, but this must be Fred Bear, Freddy's imitator. The second logbook owner also drew scenes from Sister Location, FNAF 4, and is called the bite victim by the other characters. The second owner is Freddy's kid, Michael Afton. No wonder BV hated Fred Bear. There's also Fred Bear's golden crony, Spring Bonnie. If Spring Bonnie was the first Bonnie, why don't we just call him Bonnie? And call classic Bonnie, Blue Bonnie to distinguish him from the original. But Spring Bonnie needs the modifier as the variant, so Bonnie is the original while Spring Bonnie is a golden imitator of him, like Fred Bear. Fazbear Entertainment's Help Wanted Coins claim their Freddy Fazbear's Pizza opened in 1983, still sure of 1972. Fred Bear's was open then as Freddy's sister location. It wasn't an old abandoned restaurant. Phone Guy says the multiple Springlock failure incident happened at the single sister location his new Freddy's had. That sounds like Fred Bear's. But how was Fun Guy making a tape in 1983, four years before FNAF 2? Was FNAF 2 open twice? If the new Freddy's operated earlier, Fun Guy and Fazbear Entertainment still ran it. But Fun Guy wanted to prove to Jeremy, Freddy's performer, that he and F.E. could run things better than the company that owned the old Freddy's. So Henry didn't run the original 1972 pizza place. Henry's new and improved Freddy's began in 1983, but the Freddy's phone guy wanted to surpass existed before. Henry owned the Freddy's characters by 1983. He got them from the associate company that owned them before. So Henry's new business partner, Williams Afton Robotics, originally owned the rights to Freddy's and gave them to Henry as part of a deal. The endos Henry built for the toy animatronics are childishly crude, metal logs with eyes glued on, even after cannibalizing the original robots for parts. In contrast, William's fun times are futuristic shape-shifting metal spaghetti. Henry was the business guy in the game world, but William had the talent. The reverse from Charlie's Mere Universe novels. Henry wanted William's technology, so he gave Afton an offer he couldn't refuse. Hand Unit, later revealed as an agent of Fazbear Entertainment, said the unfortunate closure of Freddy's was an opportunity for Fazbear Entertainment. 
This only works if Henry's company acquired the rights from William after some misfortune. Fastman Entertainment has plenty of money, just look at the Pizzaplex. I can't picture Henry going bankrupt, but William needed funds to keep after robotics alive. In FNAF 2, Phone Guy said Freddy and his friends were from the previous location. A previous location is more than a past opening, Freddy came from a completely different building. And in FNAF 6, we finally see it. Pizzeria Simulator is a reopening of Freddy Fazbear's Pizza Place, a small humble square building built by someone with far less money than Fazbear Entertainment. The garbage cans and wooden posters in the back alley link it to the security puppet minigame, marking Pizza Place as the site of Take Cake to the Children. It makes sense for Charlie's tragedy to be there. The struggling Freddy's state opened for years after one bad incident, while the MCI and Save Them closed their openings within weeks. Fredbear's closed shortly after its Springlock incident. The Struggling Freddy's poster appears in FNAF 1, which was open and not bankrupt, so it wasn't the Struggling Freddy's either. Take Cake to the Children happened at Freddy Fazbear's Pizza Place, as FNAF 6 suggests. Pizza Place also works as the 1972 location. In Take Cake, Freddy's performer is a little kid the same size as Henry's daughter. Freddy's hat is so large it covers his ears. We see the same Freddy hat again in Give Gifts, Give Life, but it's grown to fit a growing boy while the hat hasn't so Freddy's ears stick out and the top hat is tiny in his head. Between 1972 and the 80s, Freddy's kid, Michael, grew from a small child into a teenager. These changes are consistent with time. I said FNAF lore is consistent, and I'll keep saying it to the end. The Pizzaplex was built on top of the 1972 Pizza Place, where the echoes of what happened to Henry's daughter and William's company drive the story to this day. Scott said he retconned a small detail that didn't change the story. I believe he added the word place to the struggling Freddy's. It helps distinguish William's place from Phone Guy's new Freddy's, but it doesn't undo the struggling Freddy's poster because the name could be abbreviated. Somehow, the new Freddy's was open in summer. FNAF 1's Two Child poster says something terrible happened at Freddy's on June 26th. Two children are involved, so this isn't Take Cake. The only Freddy's we know between 1972 and FNAF 1 is Phone Guy's new Freddy's and Phone Guy starts FNAF 2 by mentioning a summer job. June is in the middle of summer, while November is on the edge of winter, but FNAF 2 only lasted two weeks in November. Save Them happens during William's week, and Jeremy slash Michael follows in the second. Then the building closed for good, and the newspaper says it was open for a few short weeks. Far short of the time between June and November. This only works if the FNAF 2 building opens twice. We have more evidence of two openings. The Withered Animatronics were the missing children incident robots from the smell, but those robots looked fine after the MCI. Bonnie still had his face. The five children got stuffed years before 1987. The MCI must have happened during the first opening in 1983. Here's a rule of thumb. Every kill event in FNAF has a different kid count. Take Cake had one victim, June 26 had two, the MCI had five, and Save Them had six pools of blood. One is hiding under the puppet's box. Help One had also had seven tombstones, and nine missing kids appear in Gregory's newspaper. There are also three screaming faces in the East Hall of FNAF 1, which could echo the multiple Springlock failure incident. These numbers help tell the incidents apart. The MCI is the only five-child kill event on record. Their bodies weren't found because the puppet hid them inside the robots in the off-camera secret room where the police never thought to look. There aren't enough robots to hide an extra set of five kids at the same location so another five children would have been discovered and shut down Freddy's faster than any health issues. So if we see a minigame with five dead kids, we know we're seeing the real missing children incident, even if what we see contradicts widely held beliefs. Foxy Gogo -Go shows the MCA from the perspective of Foxy's performer, and that its secret room is one screen east of Pirate's Cove. In the FNAF 1 building, Pirate's Cove is on the west wall of the massive dining hall, the most public space, the follow me cutscenes also show FNAF 1's secret room several screens to the northeast. FNAF 1 doesn't work as the MCI location. But the FNAF 2 building fits. Save Them's map has a blank space just east of Kid's Cove. This was Pirate's Cove back in 1983, but it became Kid's Cove in the 1987 reopening. The puppet's box is just north of here, giving her, and any potential attacker, a second way to access the room. So the MCI must have happened at the FNAF 2 building in summer 1983. There's another way to eliminate the FNAF 1 building. It's a reopening of Fredbear's. By 1992, this building was already remodeled. Help Wanted's hub is in FNAF 1's dining hall. 
but it has exit signs above both corridors leading to the office where no known exit exists. If you clip through the heavy lockers behind the office, a blocked escape route appears. When the building first opened, this egress kept guards safe. However, by 1992, the FNAF 1 building had new management who deliberately blocked this exit. FNAF 1 is another transformed and reopened building, so it was present in another form before 1992. Glitchtrap shows us what this hall used to be. When we're absorbed, we look through his eyes for a moment. All the tables are suddenly gone, leaving an open dance floor like Fred Bears in the novels and the Stage 1 minigame. FNAF 1 stages three clouds, again like Stage 01, and Spring Bonnie is on the stage instead of Freddy. Back in the summer of 1983, this building was Fred Bears, so the three screaming East Hall faces could be Fredder's multiple Springlock victims. The MCI didn't happen here. What really happened that day? Everyone blames William for the MCI, and he did work both openings of the new Freddies. FNAF 4 shows a memory of Fat William fitting a teenager into Spring Bonnie. In the novels, William was a financially shrewd Santa Claus when Fred Bears was open, yet reduced to the skeletal Dave years later when Charlie found him in the entombed Freddies. Time passed, and like the withered animatronics, William changed. William was convicted of the MCI in the game world. His 1983 conviction put his face in the criminal database, so William had to hack the facial recognition in 1987 to protect himself. Phone guy said the classic suits would be looked at by our technician. Freddy's only had one technician, and like Dave, that was William. Only William had the motive and know-how to perform the hack. Jeremy also worked both openings at the new Freddy's. Phone guy said he had a summer job, only possible in 1983. This comment was aimed at Jeremy slash Michael personally because Phone Guy ends all of his general staff calls with Remember to smile, you are the face of Freddy Fazbear's pizza. But Phone Guy never says this to Jeremy, who literally wears Freddy's face. It's like Phone Guy resents Michael for being Freddy. Phone Guy's FNAF 2 Night 1 call must have been pre recorded in 1983. It never mentions the withered or toy animatronics, which only existed as such in 87. We just heard Phone Guy talk about the 1983 Springlock incident at Fred Bears in another pre recorded call. Phone Guy called the new Freddy's doorless architecture quirky and modern, yet FNAF 2 describes itself as a reopened vintage pizzeria. Phone Guy says it's new, but the newspaper says it's old. Phone Guy's tape must be old, too. The 9 1 tape works for both openings. 83 had the MCI, while 87 had saved them. In both cases, a massacre happened on William's shift, robots got possessed and chased Afton until he transferred to the day shift, leaving the job for Jeremy slash Michael. The situation in 87 is so similar that Phone Guy replayed the same tape. Now it's time to get controversial and follow the lore to the letter. William was the guard on duty during the MCI and the one convicted of it. The Five Child poster says the person wearing the luring animatronic is the convicted suspect. But there's a conflict between this and the popular vision of the MCI. No matter who attacked, all the kids went there three times to see Foxy. So Foxy was the luring animatronic on the day of the MCI. A literal reading of this poster says William was wearing Foxy. Wasn't William supposed to be wearing Spring Bonnie when he killed the five kids? That was true in the Mirror Universe novels, where William got acquitted despite being guilty, but is it true here in the games? All Foxy did was walk into a room full of dead kids and couldn't prove he didn't kill them because there was no camera in the secret room, while the Magenta Man from Take Cake to the Children watched him enter, another person most theorists consider to be William. There's a puzzle here, and Spring Bonnie is the key. Let's reread the FNAF 1 posters carefully. The Two Child poster says a security camera saw a human enter the secret room without a suit, making him easy to identify and arrest. Police theorize he used a company mascot suit to lure the two kids, but aren't sure because this suit never appeared on camera. The Five Child poster says a security camera saw someone dressed as a cartoon mascot lure five kids into the room. There's no need to theorize about the suit because it was on camera. The person wearing this suit is a suspect convicted of the MCI, William. Both posters sound like they're talking about the same incident, but their accounts clash. If Foxy discovered five kids together, why only report two of them? In one poster, William isn't wearing a costume, in the other, he is. One sign theorizes a company mascot was used as a lure, while the other confirms using a cartoon mascot. These must be different events. June 26 was not the MCI. 
Why does it matter if a cartoon or company mascot appears? Because Spring Bonnie never appeared in Fredbear and Friends. Foxy took his place beside Fredbear in the cartoon, where William usually stands. Foxy is a cartoon mascot, but Spring Bonnie is only a company mascot. So if William wore Foxy and no kid got stuffed into Spring Bonnie, there's no evidence Spring Bonnie was at the MCI. But Spring Bonnie did appear in the Two Child event. FNAF 4 shows a memory of Fat William fitting a teenager into a strange, barefront, undecorated version of Spring Bonnie. William isn't wearing a suit, and he's using a company mascot as a lure. This scene fits the June 26 poster perfectly. But who killed the five kids then? We can prove a different robot was at the scene of the MCI. Golden Freddy is the key. The FNAF 3 fandoms must be real. They attack our electronics. These souls reshaped when the robots absorbed them, taking their appearance. That's why Susie's spectral guardian in Coming Home looks and moves like a thundering classic chica, even in death. Ghosts in FNAF look and act like they're robots. Golden Freddy is the first phantom we meet. They dematerialize in front of us, from a giant Beetlejuice face down the hall, or under a night with a disembodied flying head. Golden Freddy is a ghost who looks like Fredbear because they were bitten and absorbed by Fredbear, the only Golden Bear robot. Give Gifts Give Life says Golden Freddy was the fifth MCI kid. If Spring Bonnie or Mangle bit him, we'd call him Golden Bonnie or Ghost Mangle because that's how he'd look. Fredbear must have been at the scene of the MCI for Golden Freddy to exist as such. But how could Fredbear get in there? Most robots can enter the secret rooms alone, their programming forbids it. William could pilot Foxy into the MCI room in suit mode, but Foxy couldn't follow Shadow Freddy into the secret room on his own. His pieces show he was empty then. Fredbear would need a pilot to enter the private room. We've only seen two robot characters enter secret rooms on their own. The puppet can go anywhere, according to Phone Guy, which is how she stuffed the kids after the MCI. The other is Shadow Freddy from FNAF 3, who told each robot to follow them, then march into the secret room where none could. Golden Freddy didn't exist until Fredbear bit him. He's not the pilot. But they aren't the only ghosts inside Fredbear. Shadow Freddy is a perfect physical copy of Golden Freddy in FNAF 2, though their glowing teeth and hidden purple color show this is a different character. And when Shadow Freddy cameos in the FNAF 3 office, identified as such in the developer files, their brightness sprite looks exactly like Golden Freddy. 8-Bit Vision reveals details the naked eye can't see. It helps us tell Shadow Freddy apart from Golden Freddy in FNAF 3. It shows Mangle's fox in his royal purple eyes, William Afton's color. Both William and Fongay have different versions of Foxy. Fongay is Withered slash FNAF 1 slash MCI Foxy, but William's version became Mangle. So William was wearing future Mangle the day of the MCI. FNAF 4 shows Nightmare as a ghost living inside Fredbear, taking Fredbear's shape. But the graphics files reveal something more. The title, Nightmare, is the only thing in the Shadow Freddy Extras folder. Nightmare is Shadow Freddy. Shadow Freddy lives inside Fredbear and has the puppet's power to enter secret rooms. It's like these two are related, but we'll get to that further in. So Shadow Freddy could be our MCI attacker. FNAF 4 shows the bite was caused by a version of Fredbear casting a purple shadow. Shadow Freddy was already in Fredbear before the bite, piloting him. FNAF World told us Shadow Freddy ate souls, now we know how. So where did Shadow Freddy come from? The number of victims in each kill event corresponds to the number of new characters we see. Take Kick had one victim who became the puppet. The MCI had five victims who went into Freddy, Bonnie, Chica, Foxy, and Fredbear. Save them had six victims and six new characters, Toy Bonnie, Toy Chica, Toy Freddy, Mangle, BB, and JJ. The three haunted paper pals might also be the three Springlock failure victims. If every character we see in FNAF 2 is an origin we can trace to a kill event, that explains everyone, except the two shadows, who perfectly fit the two victims of June 26th. FNAF 4 only shows William with one of the two kids, a boy, the other is off screen. But Phone Guy said right now the new Freddy's had two special suits, with plans to acquire more. So if one kid is trying on Spring Bonnie, the other is donning Fredbear, and became our Shadow Freddy. June 26, 1983 is a Sunday, the first day of William's week. That leaves plenty of time for the MCI to happen later that week. I believe the two kids William killed on June 26 became the Shadows, then tried to get revenge on him by framing him for other murders. Shadow Freddy performed the MCI in summer 1983, and Shadow Bonnie committed to save the massacre before Jeremy's week. Funke said someone used a spare yellow suit and saved them. 
Like the unfinished bare front suit William stuffed the teen boy into in FNAF 4, which looked like a spare. Mango's developer file says he was here, but William shut off every robot except the puppet and Mangle. Mangle contains some of William's remnant, they should get along. The puppet and William pass with defeating each other during Save Them without incident. If William was the take a killer, you'd think they'd try to kill each other on sight, but the puppet and Mangle aren't worried about William, and vice versa. The he Mangle talks about is the actual Save Them attacker, the male twin of the Shadows who went into Spring Bonnie. Fun with Plush Trap is a Save Them simulator. The guard on duty during Save Them stuns a spare barefront version of Spring Bonnie with a flashlight in a hallway with two doorways on either side, just like the hall in front of the FNAF 2 office. Plush Trap gives off long, rabbit-shaped shadows in the flashlight beam and does impossible things like falling up into his chair. Phone guy said Spring Bonnie had been noticeably moved, but not by who. Fazbear Entertainment condemned Barefoot Spring Bonnie because it's haunted. Ironically, William gets spring trapped inside Barefoot Spring Bonnie, the very one he stuffed the teenage boy into on June 26th. This robot got rained on for years, but somehow stayed in suit mode. William could dive right into it without any spring cranking. Some invisible force held those spring locks open for years, no matter how wet they got, waiting for William to enter, then set off every single spring lock five seconds after he did. Natural spring lock failures set off chain reactions like Carlton's suit, but even this isn't instant. Every spring lock failing together at the exact moment after years of abuse is astronomically improbable, unless someone did it on purpose. The Man in Room 1280 tells how Andrew the Shadow Boy haunts post-spring trap William. Andrew is hell-bent on revenge for some wrong William did him in the past that he can't even remember. Now we know William stuffed him in barefoot spring Bonnie, so Andrew returned the favor. That's how Andrew slash Sammy attached himself to William in the first place. Let's fill out more links in the timeline. The building changed while William served his 30-year prison term in Springtrap. Camera 2 in FNAF 3 is nearly identical to Camera 2A from FNAF 1. It's the same hallway at the same angle with the same checkerboard trim, with the doorway halfway up the left side and FNAF 1 Bonnie at the end. Springtrap even waves behind Sammy's robot as if to say, Hi, I'm right here. Phantom slash Shadow Bonnie is in FNAF 3. He's the only character who can kill us. When he isn't doing childish things like staring at us or running behind the right monitor. Springtrap begins each night in the northeast corridor where the secret room was in FNAF 1. FNAF 3 is a reopening of FNAF 1, which was itself a reopening of Fredbear's in turn. But we're skipping a step. William gets sealed along with three arcade machines. These vintage machines are already out on the floor on night 1 before Phone Dude opens the secret room. Springtrap also looks different. He has a button now, like Stage 1 Spring Bonnie. FNAF 3 was a ruin when Phone Dude found it 30 years after Freddy's closed, but the survival logbook shows this office when it's new. Sometime in the past three decades, this place opened again under a non-Freddy's name. Someone took out the arcades, gave Springtrap a makeover, changed the floor plan to inverted Anim Dude, then sealed Springtrap back inside again to wait for Fazbear's fright. I believe this transitional opening was Chica's Party World, where Funtime Chica was the star. The unique contours of Funtime Chica's mask match the spring suit on night four of Sister Location. William built her for Circus Baby's Pizza World with the other Funtimes as a minor supporting character for one day at a doomed restaurant. And while Circus Baby's entertainment and rental sent the other Funtimes to the surface on hunting missions, Funtime Chica stayed in reserve, never used the way she was meant to be used. It's amazing anyone remembers her at all. But somehow, she's a movie star in Ultimate Custom Night and the most expensive robot in Pizzeria Simulator. Funtime Chica must have been a star at her own place. The transitional non freddys opening between FNAF 1 and 3 is perfect for her. The game's sister location must be after FNAF 3. The soap opera mentions a fire, and Michael's cutscene shows Springtrap emerging from the burned ruins of Fazbear's Fright. Michael says William asked him to infiltrate Sea Bear and get the Funtimes out. But after helping enter to escape, Michael doesn't know where William is anymore. Finding him would be easy if William never left FNAF 3. William is on the move now, his long imprisonment is over. This also means Michael is the guard in FNAF 3. He freed William from Springtrap, then got the sister location mission from him. William went on to play the role of Dave in Security Breach, leaving the code message in the sister location room for Gregory and or Michael to find. The character encyclopedia clarifies an odd detail about Sister Location's custom night cutscene. This is the one and only appearance of Dark Springtrap. He looks so much like normal Springtrap that the distinction seems unnecessary. 
yet dark Springtrap got his own Funko Pop, a dark figurine with glowing eyes and teeth like Shadow Bonnie. Although the robotic shell looks the same, Dark Springtrap is not the same character from FNAF 3, because now that William's free, Sammy's the only one left inside. Shadow Bonnie still haunted William's discarded barefront Spring Bonnie suit, and searched for new parts to make himself complete again. This might explain why Scraptrap looks 50% like Fredbear, or why Burntrap seems to be a mashup of pieces from several of their characters. Burntrap looks like the rabbit golem that formed when all the toys Andrew infused with his dark remnant combined. Scraptrap could mimic William's voice, and as the same voice actor, but his vaudeville villain lisp differs significantly from the English gentleman we heard in the sister location interview. She can dance. She can sing. She's equipped with a built-in helium tank for inflating balloons right at her fingertips. Father, it's me, Michael. I found it. It was right where you said it would be. How can I resist a promise such as this? Scraptrap constantly reminded everyone that he was William, and it contained some of William's negative remnant after being connected to him for decades. But Scrap Baby didn't buy it, and still considered the person who called them her real father. Henry is another case of one character in FNAF pretending to be another. Pizzeria Simulator must be after Sister Location. The escaped fun times split into Scrap Baby and Molten Freddy after Michael smuggled them out in his android abdomen. Fourth Closet Henry slash Cassette Man finally reappears after vanishing since Fredbear is closed. Henry's company Fazbear Entertainment still owns Pizza Place after buying it decades earlier. Henry wanted Michael to be the FNAF 6 guard and burden with the others, but Michael had already talked to the real William and knew this was a trap, so he didn't show. The position sat vacant for months while Scrap Trap and the others clawed at the walls trying to get inside. Finally, another member of the family showed up. The survival logbook teaser suggests this was Classic Chica's kid. Security Breach supports this because a possessed version of Classic Chica somehow got inside the blob with the melted FNAF 6 robots. No version of Chica was an antagonist in Pizzeria Simulator, so Classic Chica must have come from the guard. Molten Freddy called him a birthday boy. Scrap Baby and Henry recognized him, but he wasn't who they expected to see. This guard somehow survived the overheating building to get the company's sign-off message, only leaving a piece of himself behind. He was one of the android Afton kids, with fragments of his soul spread across several closet versions like Charlie in the novels. Now, let's go far back in time. Security Breach has old-time posters about Freddy's that appear to come from the early 1900s. How is this possible? Midnight Motorist holds the key. MM is strongly linked to the security puppet minigame, or a telling of Take Cake to the Children. The same storm rages, the file is called Later That Night. We seem to play the role of the magenta man who attacked Henry's daughter. Our car has a magenta aura, while the others glow purple. But when we leave the car, things change. When seen at a distance, we turn into a fat, straight-backed, square yellow man, then become a thin, slouching, round orange man when we get near the house. These sprites are perfect opposites, like William Save Them Sprite and the Magenta Man. And then, a colossal twist changes everything. Take Cake happened at Pizza Place in the US, but the cars and midnight motorists drive on the left side of the road. This isn't the US, it's England! The game wants us to compare it to Take Cake, but the scene unfolds in a different place and time. Most believe William is the yellow slash orange man and the magenta man. Even though it seems strange to stab someone outside your own restaurant to make sure it goes bankrupt, Freddy says secret rooms where you can kill people quietly, and luring people into those rooms is William's famous style of killing. The Magenta Man is not only the graphical opposite of William, he also has the opposite modus operandi for killing someone in public. I agree that William must link Take Cake to Midnight Motorist. William has an English accent. He appears as a white-haired English grandfather in the FNAF 6 poster holding a puppet of himself. And William is his own version of Foxy, famous for taking a long sea voyage. So William immigrated from England before he built Freddy's in the US. But answer me this. Which character wanted to travel to the US? The yellow orange man, who already had a house and family in England? Or the kid, who wanted to flee this abusive household so badly he was willing to tear his flesh of the jagged window glass to get out? He regularly ran off to Junior's, where the green guy keeps the yellow slash orange man out. And one day, this kid ran away for good, taking his favorite robot with him. William Afton was the abused kid from Midnight Motorist, not the yellow orange man or the Take Cake killer. William created the puppet that phone guy didn't like, and programmed it to keep Henry's daughter from leaving the party, expecting she would come inside. 
Like Mangle, he also imbued the puppet with part of his remnant, allowing it to float even before it absorbed any of Charlie's soul. It was literally a puppet of himself, as in the poster. William saved what remained of Charlie after the Magenta Man's attack. This is why William and the puppet trust each other and save them, and why Henry had to send a killer bear robot after the puppet to drag her to Pizzeria Simulator. The puppet trusted William, but not her father. William could have done anything in the half-century between leaving England as a kid and founding Freddy's in 1972 as a grandfather. I call this Uncharted era the prehistory of FNAF. The old-time posters we see in Security Beach are artifacts from this time. Let's return to the sister location complex. What exactly is Circus Baby's entertainment and rental up to? Seabear is a shell corporation for Fazbear Entertainment. Artifacts from Henry's family, like Charlie's dorm room project, are inside. And when the fun times finally escape after decades of nightly torture, Henry shows up to deal with them. Mr. Fredbear knows what's been happening there. Michael and William had to risk life and limb sneaking their Funtime family members out. If William's Afton Robotics owned Seabear, he could do all that with the stroke of a pen. Don't forget that William just spent 30 years torturously imprisoned in a secret room. That's a strange place for a rich company to leave their CEO. The Funtime blueprints reveal sinister functions. Funtime Foxy can record parent voices and play them back. Ballora is designed to deter and misdirect. Bonbon bon is a pivoting parent tracker, while Funtime Freddy can also lure people by mimicking voices. He has a notorious kid compartment marked as a storage tank, oddly similar to Gregory's mech pilot's seat inside Glamrock Freddy. Baby has her killer claw and can lure kids closer by making ice cream. The Funtimes are a heist team designed to abduct children. But why? Henry clarifies this in Pizzeria Simulator. He designed child decoy bots to keep the escaped animatronics running in circles, knowing they were programmed to hunt children. Then he ordered them to give up the spirits of the children they devoured when he overheated the building. Souls. The robots are hunting souls. And the fragments of souls called Remnant, a force of life and power according to Eleanor. This has been Fazbear Entertainment's goal since FNAF 1. Why would Henry's company block the emergency exit unless they wanted more fatalities? They reel in hapless workers with the promise of an easy minimum wage job, then inform them of the danger only when it's too late. Why is the power limited? Especially in FNAF 2 when the building can't run out, but the flashlight can? Doesn't anyone have an extension cord? Why do the doors fly open when the power runs out instead of fail-safing to a closed position? Why do they take energy to keep shut? This building is a deliberately designed death trap. Fastbrand Entertainment knows about the fatalities, but instead of fixing the problem, they hide the bodies and only file a missing persons report 90 days after the bloody carpets are replaced, then usher the next victim inside. Henry's company is running a dangerous, expensive murder racket. And what do they get for it? The dead bodies of people with no money? Something in those bodies must be valuable enough to make it all worthwhile. So, how do the robots extract souls? This secret is in the last call of FNAF 1, a link to Chapter 8 of the book An Autobiography of a Yogi. Chapter 8 is about Dr. Bose's theory of living metal, that on a micro scale, metal has the same ability to grow, heal, and die that flesh has. So metal is a living material that could become part of someone's body. Other scientists didn't confirm Dr. Bose's theory, so it's pseudoscience in our world. But in the universe of FNAF, it's real. Springtrap looks like a perfect fusion of flesh and metal where you can't tell where one material ends and the other begins. The MCI robots can still do human things like breathing and eating pizza because the flesh of the kids stuffed into them never died. It just became part of a new hybrid system and happily went on generating blood and mucus. Here's the central mechanic behind everything in FNAF. What happens when a springlock suit cuts into a human pilot wearing it properly in suit mode? The springlocks are metal razors that connect the human to the robot, temporarily merging the two beings. The robot now counts as part of that person's body, so their soul can flow into it like air filling a vacuum, and stay behind in the robot once the springlocks disengage. From then on, the animatronic is animated by part of the pilot's soul. It's a weird but mechanically simple way to create a Horcrux backup copy of the pilot that will live on if their organic body dies. At first look, the spring suits seem like a terrible design. Why keep an endoskeleton pried open under immense pressure when you can build an exoskeleton that won't crush you? If all you want is a wearable robot, 
Iron Man is the right idea. But the spring locks are crucial to the Afton's true goal of putting their souls into robots, then updating those copies by reconnecting to their mini-mechs regularly. So they kept using the spring suits, generation after generation, no matter what went wrong. Immortality is the only prize worth the risk of death. William's technology has a dark application, though. Springlocks can also drain souls from the innocent. The twisted animatronics engulfed victims and stabbed them with springlocks until they were either dead or had no soul left to steal. That's why Wolfie spit out his victim while she was still alive. He wasn't after meat or blood. Game Henry sent board members to interrogate William about Baby's design so Phasma Entertainment could make an army of soul-devouring predators. A secret novel William was willing to sacrifice his own organs to learn. Henry just saved William from bankruptcy. Surely Aftim owed him a favor. But Game William didn't cooperate, listing Baby's secondary functions instead of telling Phasma Entertainment what it wanted to know. Game William was a good man who single-handedly prevented an animatronic apocalypse. But Game Henry found a workaround. If his company couldn't make fun times of their own, he would reprogram William's robots into Predators instead, the same way Dr. Wily reprogrammed Dr. Light's robots. So Henry took the robots William already made and turned them into killers. This plan had a sickening twist. Most of William's bots already had the souls of family members inside them, members who thought they could spend eternity cheering children. But Henry turned this dream into a nightmare, forcing these innocent souls to devour the very children they wished to entertain, and then get disemboweled by the scooper each night when they return to base. The scooper keeps the haunted metal it extracts hot and malleable, because otherwise, the haunted metal moves and tries to escape. Henry was willing to do anything to make money, including endlessly torturing his wife. Let's look at the Afton family tree. Henry's daughter Charlie is a nuclear family with one dad, mom, sister, and brother. Yet Nennybot's Security Breach family has five members, Elizabeth, Bite Victim Michael, William the Magician, and Michael's older brother. Two brothers don't fit in a nuclear family. They must belong to a different branch. Elizabeth respects Ballora, but calls her Ballora, not Mommy, even though she calls William Daddy. Ballora isn't Elizabeth's mother or William's wife. Nannybot is a conservative English matron with a long concealing skirt for modesty, but Ballora wears a tutu so short you can see her undercarriage. Mary Poppins would not approve of this. Nattybot and Ballora are as opposite as William and the Magenta Man. A family with two branches must have two mothers, and Ballora is the mother of the puppet-like Minnie Renas. If she's the mother of the small puppets, why not the big one? There's also a grandfather in the Afton family. A grandfather clock hides in the darkness of FNAF 4, and the song My Grandfather's Clock pacifies the puppet. Henry is a man in his prime. But William is a white-haired Englishman in the FNAF 6 posters. William is Charlie's grandfather, one reason the puppet got along with him and saved them. So, if William is Charlie's grandfather, Charlie's father must be one of William's sons. That's why I think Michael's older brother is Henry. The leaked teaser for Sister Location said the person who funded Circus Babies was local. But William's struggling company didn't have the money until Henry returned to town at the head of Phasma Entertainment to buy out the family business. Children in FNAF can mimic their parents. That's why Michael sounded like William in Sister Location. And how Henry fooled most of his family into thinking he was William by calling them in a pre-recorded message, like Phone Guy does. The Fear Two Company Association began at Circus Baby's Pizza World. A sudden change in Baby's design shows exactly when Henry took over. Game William made Baby just for Elizabeth, the robot that was supposed to be her. But shortly after William finished Baby, Fazbear Entertainment appeared and sent board members to interrogate William about her design. Henry's company funded the gala launch of Circus Babies and the fleet of vehicles that tore down in a single night, a lavish display of wealth after robotics couldn't afford. So Henry's company was in charge the day Circus Babies launched. Something happened that day. William suddenly forbade Elizabeth from going anywhere near her own Horcrux animatronic. Baby was different. The air hose and her arm for the helium tank is still there, but the tank wasn't. Someone changed Baby's design. William knew about the change, but couldn't prevent it because Henry was in charge. So William could only warn his daughter. Charlie's novels are a mere universe to the games. Novel William didn't care about Elizabeth, made Baby for himself, and designed her as a killing machine from the start. But Game William cared deeply about his daughter and designed Baby to protect her. Afton was the robotics master of the games instead of business guy Henry. 
Baby remembers being compelled to count the kids in the room, though she didn't know why. When only one remained, she was suddenly no longer herself. Her body automatically lured the kid with ice cream and devoured them. Baby still has nightmares about Elizabeth's quickly silent screaming and tearfully wonders why that happened. Who decides to kill a robot with a conscience they must turn off for every job? Nobody. Fast Entertainment reprogrammed Baby into a soul-harvesting monster against her will. Sister locations don't hold it against us, Teaser backs this up. Most of FNAF's robots only kill because their corrupted programming forces them to. In fact, Bonnie and Chica try not to kill Mike Schmidt in FNAF 1. Sure, they make a show of leering at the corner cameras and grinning outside the door, but this requires them to pass the open office doors twice. It's easiest to see this in Help Wanted, where they march right past the office unless you zap them with the hull lights. If they wanted you dead, you'd be dead. Instead, Bonnie and Chica are doing everything they can to give you time to react, but someone else is controlling them. AR Toy Freddy doesn't even remember killing us. Hello? Hello? Well, why won't you say something? Soul devouring robots are bad enough, but robots with the souls of your family members trapped inside? Forced to murder children every week, then get disemboweled when they return to base? And remember everything that happened each and every night for unending decades? No wonder Blora fears the scooping room and the fun times want to escape. They didn't sign up for this. The main skeleton of the timeline is in place. Now it's time to assemble the story. William Afton was a good kid with an abusive guardian back in England. So he fled his former home and took a long voyage across the sea to the US, taking his favorite robot, probably pre-Mangle Foxy, with him. He began to forge a new family in the States that would live happily, literally forever. William honed his robotics and mad science skills until he could make androids with Terminator-style synthetic flesh and full human functionality. His family could shed their short human lives and put their souls into android replicas of themselves that looked so real only a doctor could tell the difference. Every Afton kid could have a normal human life, yet call upon hidden robotic powers when needed. Afton androids are immortal, as Trolley discovered in the Twisted Ones when her friends kept changing while she stayed the same. So the Afton family used several closet forms to maintain the illusion of growing up. When it's time to age, the remnant slash memories of the younger android are siphoned into the new, older-looking model. This isn't a perfect process. Like the ice cream scooper analogy from Sister Location, there's always some remnant left in the corners the scooper can't get to. So a spark of soul still animates the earlier forms even after the transfer. Several different closet versions of the same kid can be active at once. The adults could talk to the children they used to be. People would be suspicious if four kids with the same name kept running around. So the Afton family disguised their outgrown forms. Henry turned off Ella's illusion ship so she looked like a doll again. Other first closet children became balloon kids and continued life as robots. The second and third closet kids are harder to hide, so the family gives them new names and makeovers. That's why Susie looks like a blonde version of Charlie. Susie is one of Charlie's outgrown forms, now with her own name in life. Each kid is a guardian robot, a Horcrux animatronic animated by their remnant. These spring suits extract and safeguard parts of their soul while upgrading. They are too large to pass as humans, so William hid them under cheesy pizza mascot costumes. The world could laugh at the silly robots pretending to be alive and never know the truth. William could make tons of money if he showed the world everything his robots could do. But if the world discovered his living metal creations, the government or some evil corporation would seize his robots and the pieces of his family's souls they guarded. So Grandfather William barred the family robots from free roaming during the day at the original 1972 Freddy's, only letting them off leech each night between midnight and 6 a.m., a restriction in their programming that still echoes to this day. While the humans and or androids were sleeping upstairs, the animatronics would come to life and guard them while having their own adventures. William built four robots for the four kids in the family in 1972. Older brother Henry got Foxy, younger brother Michael got Freddy, while Henry's kids, Sammy and Charlie, were supposed to receive Bonnie and Chica. Everything was fine at first. Older brother Foxy played in harmony with a family band. But William got into an argument with Henry and disinherited him by granting the starring role of Freddy to his younger son Michael. Older brother Henry became full of envy and hate and left to build his own company that would do things his way. Henry's robots weren't as good as William's, but he let them show off, so Fazbear Entertainment took off. When Afton Robotics was on the verge of financial collapse, 
Henry returned to town with the head of his new company and bought out the family business. Henry couldn't be Freddy, the starring role he craved, so he created Fredbear as a superior golden knockoff, then forced unworthy Michael to guard Fredbears so everyone would know who the real star was. Henry was a third closet teen in 1972, but when he built Fredbears, he upgraded to his adult form cassette man, the man in the Fredbear suit. He still loved Foxy, so he made his old avatar a private elite stage away from the rest of the family. And he chose the only person he could trust to run the new Freddies. Our number one fan of Fazbear Entertainment and pre-recorded messages, Phone Guy, his own retired through closet form. Afton androids like Charlie have photographic memories, but Remnant is made of memories, a power that can be collected by flesh and metal or drained from them. Teen Charlie couldn't remember most of her childhood because that remnant was transferred to Fourth Closet Baby, leaving only traces behind. Henry spliced in happy memories to fill the gaps, but Charlie felt something was wrong and couldn't stop until she found the truth. When a character in FNAF has trouble remembering something they should know, it could be a sign of remnant drain. Phone Guy built Fredbear's family diner. He should easily remember its name. But Cassette Man has those memories, leaving Phone Guy's recollection full of holes. The conflict between Henry and Michael comes to life in the Bear of Vengeance enemy. Foxy the Pirate stole Freddy's dojo, and Freddy wants it back. The dojo is the FNAF 2 building since Mangle is there. And every time Freddy tries to get revenge, his older brother curb stomps him. Foxy could destroy Freddy anytime, but decides to humiliate him instead. So Freddy has to do Foxy's laundry and cooking, which Foxy somehow feels safe eating. Foxy and Freddy hate each other, but still share a powerful bond. Freddy has access to Foxy's food and clothes because he lives in the same house. Foxy and Freddy are the avatars of William's sons, Henry and Michael. Henry captured Freddy's long ago and loves rubbing it in Michael's face. Phone Guy is still jealous about being disinherited at Pizza Place, so he doesn't like to admit Jeremy slash Michael is the face of Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. Phone Guy wants to prove that his company can run things better than William, so he makes a point of doing things differently. Henry let the robots free roam during the day at the new Freddy's, which worked well, until people started to die. A murder in a mystery needs a motive, something the killer plans to gain. So who benefited from Take Cake to the Children? It ruined William's pizza paradise. Michael got to be the star for part of one day before everything rusted. Charlie got stabbed and left to die. The only family member with a reason to celebrate was Henry. The fallout from Take Cake allowed him to take over the family business. Phone Guy, Third Closet Henry, was the real Magenta Man. He was an outsider to Pizza Place in 1972 after he clashed with William but an insider to the new Freddy's during Foxy Go Go in summer 1983. Third Closet Henry also had a second, more personal motive for stabbing his daughter. Ironically, he wanted to save her. Afton children get their Horcrux animatronics as birthday presents, a celebration of their new life as androids, as their human lives end. Little Michael got Freddy during the Take Cake party, echoed in a FNAF 1 drawing that shows a kid with Michael's colors getting a gift from an adult-sized Freddy. William was the first Freddy before handing off the title. In FNAF 3, a pair of twins cheer as an orange-tinted classic Chica pops out of a birthday cake. Sammy gets Bonnie in a FNAF 1 drawing, where the word me applies to them both. Funtime Freddy calls Michael and the FNAF 6 protagonist birthday boys, since they both got their robotic presents. The puppet gives gifts to the MCI kids on the first day of their new life as robots. Robotic immortality is the gift William gave to his family. But Charlie didn't share Michael's good fortune. The rift between Henry and William made her a target for the other kids. Michael could have kept them from locking her outside, but he didn't. Charlie was supposed to receive Classic Chica at that party. When the kids shunned her, it was more than a childhood prank. It denied Charlie her immortality. If Henry's daughter died before bonding with a robot and generating a backup copy, she'd die for real and never see William's paradise. Dr. Talbert faced the same problem in the Fazbear Fright books. His daughter Ronelle was ill, and he wasn't sure she'd survive. So Talbert used mad science in a last-ditch effort to save his daughter. I should have known you wouldn't be content to disappear. Not my daughter. I couldn't save you then, so let me save you now. He took some of Ronell's remnant and put it into a silver heart-shaped locket to create a backup copy of her. A horcrux. But his experiment backfired. Instead of a clone, Talbert got an inversion of Ronell. It's only now that I understand the depth of the depravity of this 
creature, this monster that I unwittingly helped to create. He unwittingly created Eleanor, an evil version of Baby, the true main antagonist of the Fazbear Fright books. Third Closet Henry wanted to save Charlie the same way, so Phone Guy made sure her remnant went into a robot that day by collecting it himself with a silver knife. The same way Dave killed Officer Dunn, then used his soul to create Wolfie. Teen Henry used this remnant to build JJ, the game's version of Ella, Charlie's first closet form. Ella is also linked to Eleanor in the Fazbear Fright books. But in his haste and inexperience, older brother Henry made a mistake. He only got half of Charlie's remnant, splitting his daughter's soul into two pieces, leaving one half behind for the puppet. Phone Guy never liked that puppet thing. He didn't build it and considered JJ his real daughter. Charlie was the first victim of FNAF's drama, but her twin brother was the second. Because when Henry got home later that night, he did the same thing to Sammy. Henry's twins went everywhere together, but they were also different. Charlie loved to see twitchy robots inside the animal costumes, while Sammy preferred humans. Charlie badly wanted to become a robot, but Sammy didn't want his soul torn into pieces. So when Charlie left for the take cake party, Sammy stayed home. Cut to Henry, the magenta man, driving home at breakneck speed in his magenta glowing car. His pulse is pounding, the thrill of what he just did warring with his conscience. Did he do the right thing? But it's too late to turn back now because he has to finish what he started and do what's best for his children, and make sure his twins stay together forever. Thunder pounds as he parks his car by the house and his inverted sprite goes inside. But unlike Kid William from Midnight Motorist, half a century ago in England, Sammy doesn't escape through the window. Sammy doesn't escape at all as his father enters the room. Let's revisit Fun with Balloon Boy, that part of FNAF 4's Halloween edition that Scott oddly said was canon. What new thing are we supposed to learn here? With some digging, we can prove Balloon Boy is Sammy's first closet form. The girl in the FNAF 4 park where the toys her father made for her wears a purplish shirt and blue jeans, the outfit Charlie said she always wore at the start of the Silver Eyes. Plush Trap Kid shares several perfect RGB color matches with her, marking him as Toy Girl's twin. FNAF 4 Balloon Boy also shares several matches with Plush Trap Kid, like BB is another version of him, which fits since Plush Trap and BB share the same minigame. Toy Girl is the twin of Plush Trap Kid, who's also Balloon Boy. So Toy Girl is BB's twin, JJ. JJ and Ella share the same magenta cheeks, identifying Toy Girl as Charlie. So Plush Trap Kid slash BB must be her twin, Sammy. BB also evolves into the Bonnie Bully, marking Sammy as Bonnie's kid. Fun with Plush Trap slash BB reenacts William's memory of being the guard during Save Them, who had to stop Sammy's rampaging barefront spring Bonnie with a flashlight. But there's another memory hidden here. In the near-right doorway, William saw someone grab Sammy by the ankles and drag him away so violently his head hit the floor. William saw someone else abduct Sammy. Sammy's pain echoes Kid William's own from Midnight Motorist, as the one minigame tells two linked stories. But Sammy didn't want to become a robot. Sammy was someone Henry should not have killed. Charlie might have forgiven her father for knifing her, but never her innocent twin brother. So both of Henry's twins became robots in 1972, and both grew up to have third closet teen forms by 1983. By this time, the pain of losing Elizabeth broke William, and he vowed to get revenge on Henry for what Fazbear Entertainment did to his daughter and his life's work. So William lured third closet Sammy and Charlie into the back room on June 26, 1983 to try on the golden suits, which failed, turning Henry's twins into the shadows. William hoped revenge would heal the pain, but revenge never heals, it only causes more harm. The Shadows swore counter-revenge on William, and were willing to sacrifice even more innocent kids to do it. Shadow Freddy performed the MCI, biting that jerk Michael who locked her out of the party, and Shadow Bonnie executed Save Them, becoming William's personal demon. All to frame William for murders he didn't commit. All in the name of revenge, a fire that consumes all. Charlie was an innocent girl who just wanted to belong, but Michael and the party kids shunned her because she was different. Her father used her as a pawn to take over the family business. Then her grandfather killed her the second time to get counter-revenge on Henry. All the pain and suffering twisted this unfortunate little girl into a monster, and Shadow Freddy vowed she would be the victor instead of a victim from then on. 
So after Cassette Man mysteriously disappeared after Fredbear's closed, Shadow Freddy slash Nightmare slash Anti Charlie, the game's version of Eleanor, took control. Shadow Freddy was the new manager when Phasm Entertainment reopened Fredbear's as the FNAF 1 building. And like her father before her, she did things differently. She blocked the emergency exit to increase fatalities. Then she turned Foxy's special stage into a prison, letting her father's avatar rot behind a fake out of order sign. And she took Phone Guy's place after devouring him in the Night 4 call, then mimicked her father's voice in the other calls. The real Phone Guy loved Foxy as much as himself, and would never mistreat him like this. But the Phone Guy we hear in FNAF 1 coldly calls Foxy the character and lets him rot while maintaining all the other robots. If Fastman Entertainment could replace all the carpets every 90 days, they could fix Foxy. <laughs> all of Freddy's laughter in FNAF 1 is the sound of Shadow Freddy's girlish giggling slowed down. She enjoyed sending Mike Schmidt a recording of her devouring the real phone guy in Night 4, showing he's been dead for some time, then dropped the mimic act and warded into the phone like a monster on Night 5. But how did Shadow Freddy get control of Freddy in FNAF 1? This argument takes a few steps. First, we must prove all five MCI kids were Afton Android kids. Phone Guy says the secret room is off limits to customers, yet the five kids visited this room three times under the supervision of a cast member. Since they didn't get banned and Foxy didn't get fired, their presence didn't violate this rule. These kids weren't customers, they were family. But we need more than that. Ever wonder why the robots have two sets of teeth? The character encyclopedia brought special attention to this. The easy, readily available answer says the powered inner jaw puppets the useless outer jaw. But this model breaks down with testing. Shadow Freddy's external teeth glow, showing they have power. Plush Tramp chomps with his outer jaw while the inner teeth hardly move. What gives? Golden Freddy, a ghost who looks like Fredbear, doesn't have an inner jaw. Fredbear's robot parts hide in the lining of his costume. You can see them in his ankles, but his head appears empty. So the visible inner jaw is not a standard feature for a spring suit. The pilot's jaw is the only second one you should see. Classic Freddy and his friends are also spring suits. If Fredbear is a spring suit, and a copy of Freddy, Freddy is a spring suit too. You can take off Freddy's head and wear it in Take Cake, Give Gifts Give Life, and the FF story You're the Band, because it's designed to be worn. The puppet didn't stuff kids with magic, she put them into suits that were already wearable. Dave didn't need the puppet's help to stuff the MCI kids into the classic suits in the novels, and he told Carlton, who he'd just trapped in a spring suit, he'd done the same thing to all of them. Phone Guy suspended activating or wearing the classic suits at the New Freddy's after Fredbear's springlock failure incident, because they were spring suits too. That's how William wore Foxy into the MCI room, where Foxy couldn't normally go. Withered Foxy's wrecked costume shows he has an Endo-02 underneath, with metal limb cages that enable a human to fit inside. The Endo-01 stick figures from FNAF 1 never needed such cages to fill out their fursuits. No spring suit should have a visible inner jaw. Fred Baron's spring bonnie didn't, at first. Barefoot's spring bonnie had empty eye sockets until William jumped inside and lit them with his blazing white orbs. When we peel back Sammy's grinning, expressive, powered face mask, we see William's screaming, glowing-eyed face inside. Barefoot Spring Bonnie only has an inner jaw because William's android endo is trapped inside. Sammy and Plush Trap chomp with Spring Bonnie's powered outer jaw, while William's inner teeth remain motionless. Spring Bonnie has an inner jaw because William's endoskeleton is trapped inside. And Freddy, Bonnie, Chica, and Foxy have inner jaws because the kids stuffed into them had android endoskeletons too. All five non-customer MCI kids were androids, and therefore, members of the Afton family. So when Shadow Freddy attacked the MCI kids, she knowingly targeted family members, especially Michael, who locked her out of the Take Cake restaurant years earlier. That sets the stage for how Shadow Freddy controls Freddy in FNAF 1. Now let's do a logic puzzle. Which kid ended up in which MCI robot? There were four kids in 1972, but Charlie never got to bond with Chica. Pieces of her went into the puppet and JJ instead. Now there are five kids in 1983, and one of them owns Charlie's unused robot. The Chica bully in FNAF 4 is a boy. The birthday boy Molten Freddy talked about in FNAF 6. So classic Chica's kid is now part of the family. Bibby devoured Elizabeth at Circus Babies, so she's not part of the MCI as such. Although a version of Elizabeth probably is one of the six Save Them victims four years later. 
So we have five kids and five robots. The puppet will try to put each kid into their guardian robot so the pieces of the remnant recombine, like the kids chasing their pictures in the fourth closet amalgam. So young Henry goes into Foxy, young Sammy into Bonnie, and classic Chica's kid into her. That part is straightforward. But now there's a twist. Young Michael should go into Freddy, but Fredbeard bite of 83'd him, making him the real golden Freddy. Freddy is the only robot left, and young Charlie is the last unstuffed kid. No bodies were found, so every kid went into a robot. By elimination, young Charlie went into Freddy, directly infusing Freddy with remnant from JJ Charlie, Shadow Freddy's kid. That's how Shadow Freddy controls Freddy in FNAF 1. The piece of JJ Charlie the puppet put into Freddy is still there in 1992, so Freddy has two jump scares. Michael's blue-eyed one when we run out of power, and Charlie's office ambush with only her pinprick eyes showing. JJ Charlie is the one who hangs out in the girl's bathroom. She doesn't want anyone to touch Freddy because that's her robot now. Several child pictures tell the story of how Charlie took over Freddy. A kid with a magenta shirt and blue jeans, like Charlie in FNAF 4, dances as Freddy sings, clearly loving his voice. Fredbear tries to sing, but fails miserably. This must be Henry wearing Fredbear since no one would program Fredbear to sing badly. Henry's still trying to outdo Michael, but Michael's a better singer. That's why Freddy still has the mic even in Fredbear's cartoon. An older version of Charlie still loves Freddy's voice and its golden Freddy-like notes. But then, horror. The fourth frame shows Freddy singing shadow purple notes instead. One of his eyes is bright and determined, while the other is dim and horrified, just like the conflicted Freddy poster in the West Hall corner. The two entities in this robot do not get along. If both were versions of Michael, they'd fuse like the picture kids in the fourth closet instead of trying to tear off each other's heads. Michael is the real Golden Freddy, who sings the golden notes, but the golden bear ghost in FNAF 1 is Shadow Freddy, a dark aspect of Charlie. One last issue before we play back the MCI. Why am I being so cryptic about classic Chica's kid? Why shouldn't one of the five MCI kids and a game protagonist be acknowledged? I had a powerful disagreement about him on the Game Theorist Discord, but it's crystal clear, at least to me, that the Chica bully isn't Blonde Susie. Susie is Toy Chica's kid. She's one of the six Lorekeeper tombstones for the six Save Them victims, and her stone corresponds to Chica's at the end of FNAF 3. Toy Chica poses next to the puppet's paper pal, and without the beak, they both have the same semicircular smile at the same angle like a pair of twins. A version of Charlie finally reclaimed a version of her favorite character, Chica. That's why Auntie Charlie created Chica's Party World, sending both Freddy and Fredbear to the bleachers so Fundime Chica could be the star, with that same semicircular smile. If you're going to glorify someone's character, why not your own? Toy Chica doesn't like her orange beak, which the character encyclopedia makes terrifyingly clear. But classic Chica loves orange. It's her only color when she pops out of a cake in a FNAF 3 drawing. And one of the three kids tearing apart Mangle with superhuman strength wears an orange shirt. The kid holding Mangle's head has Michael Afton's purple and blue color scheme, while the kid with Mangle's eye has Sammy slash Plush Trap Kid's green shirt. Since Orange Shirt must be a super strong android member of the family, and is hanging out with Freddy and Bonnie's kids, and also shares a unique resemblance to the Chica Bully, he's classic Chica's kid. The kid who did return in Pizzeria Simulator, even though his novel counterpart said he never, ever would. I call classic Chica's kid Lamar, in honor of Charlie's novel friend, who also wore an orange shirt. Pizzeria Simulator's protagonist is the legendary Lamar Afton. Lamar is more than just a curiosity. He provides a vital clue about why William disinherited Henry and why the Take Cake kids shunned Charlie. The two acts of intolerance that stirred all the horrors in FNAF. I believe Henry married someone his conservative English father disapproved of, and went so ballistic because Henry was the first victim on the timeline. The first victim who became a monster. A wound first inflicted on me, but then one that I let bleed out to cause all of this. But I'll address this controversy in the fourth chapter of the Afton Family Horcruxes. Now it's time to play back the MCI. Young versions of Henry, Michael, Sammy, Charlie, and Lamar await William's appearance in Future Mangle. Shadow Freddy uses her puppet-like power to pilot Fredbear into the secret room while William is out. She bite of 83's Michael, turning him into the real Golden Freddy, then kills the others so there are no witnesses and escapes to the north. William enters in Foxy to find all five dead kids and can't prove he's innocent since there are no security cameras in the back room. 
The puppet stuffs the kids she can back into the Guardian robots, but has to put young Charlie into Freddy since they're the last kid and robot left. The Freddy bully looks like a boy, like all the bullies, but they have Shadow Freddy-like empty eyes while the others have possessed pinpricks. This spirit is supposed to be Michael, but Shadow Freddy possesses him from within. After the MCI, both Freddy and Fredbear have pieces of Michael and Charlie in them. Freddy and Shadow Freddy, trying to coexist. I prefer to call the Golden Bear Ghost Yellow Bear because it's a fusion of both. Yellow Bear can be your greatest friend or worst enemy, depending on whether Golden Freddy or Shadow Freddy is in control. When Golden Freddy saved Charlie's friends in the Silver Eyes, they could feel it was their friend Michael. But when John encountered Fredbear and the Twisted Ones, he detected a ghostly presence inside but felt no trace of Michael. The Golden Duo takes turns being in control, like a creature with a split personality. Now it's time to fill a plot hole. If Michael Afton was the Bite of 87 victim who died in FNAF 4, how did he come back as the protagonist of FNAF 3 and Sister Location? Where has Michael been all this time? The ending to FNAF 4 ties directly into the beginning of FNAF World. The canon ending of FNAF World, strange to have if it's non-canon, shows the same voice talking as our protagonist escapes this digital realm. Old Man Consequence has lost himself in this digital matrix. It's a realm that can capture and hold the souls of visitors like our own. But why? Freddy Krueger gains power by imprisoning the souls of victims in his chest. Nightmare Freddy's knife hands and frontal chest directly reference Krueger, a creature who attacks people in nightmares. FNAF 4, FNAF World, and Ultimate Custom Night are all parts of a virtual Matrix-like prison. Shadow Freddy uses this Matrix to hold and feed on the souls she's captured. FNAF 4 can't be a real, physical place. Flowers have bare heads, Plush Trap falls up into his chair, and a flying cupcake eats us instead. Pills, IVs, and flowers exist by the bed only in a quantum state. Tiny plushies turn to giant robots, and severed bare heads teleport onto our bed. This place might look natural, but it doesn't act like it. Time is warped. We have Fat William and the MCI from 1983, the Toy Dematronics and the Second Bite from 1987, the FNAF 1 Night 1 Call from 1992 that says the Bite victim is still in a coma. Then the Bite victim dies at the end of FNAF 4, dating it after FNAF 1. Where in time is Carmen San Diego? FNAF 4 must be a virtual space crafted from the memories of different places and times. A matrix of terror controlled by Nightmare, who attacks us with a single frame jump scare just like FNAF 1 Yellow Bear, who crushes our game just like FNAF 2 Shadow Bonnie. The bite we see in FNAF 4 is impossible. Both bites happen at Freddy's, not Fredbear's. BV already knows what will happen when the days to the party counter reaches zero. The bites of 83 and 87 are already in the past. This must be a reenactment. The FNAF 4 bite doesn't work on its own, but it does function as a mashup of the other two. BV and the four bullies are the five MCI kids from 1983. Everyone but the bite victim got a robot because Shadow Freddy's Fredbear bit him both times. But unlike the MCI, Michael is the only victim in this scene, as the already possessed robots feed him to Fredbear as the bite of 87. We're seeing the memories from two different bitten versions of Michael merge into one scene. Shutter Freddy also threw in Michael's memory of Henry forcing him to work at Fredbear's, just to be cute. Jeremy slash Michael must be the Bite of 87 victim. The new Freddy's is the only location open in 1987. Save them caused the lockdown, the Bite wasn't part of it. Phone Guy never mentions a Bite in FNAF 2, so it wasn't before his last call on Night 6. It must happen on Night 7, when Jeremy went to the day shift party. The robots are only hostile to staff, and nobody else can get in. William, Phone Guy, and Fritz survive FNAF 2, leaving Jeremy as the only candidate. Foxy-loving Phone Guy knew ordering his younger brother to wear his uniform and stand as close to the staff eating robots as possible was a bad idea. Phone Guy plays the same bite-enabling role as remorseful older brother Foxy. FNAF loves fake names. Fazbear Entertainment doesn't rehire previous employees, so you need a phony name to sneak back in. Michael was Eggs Benedict in Sister Location. Michael Afton and Jeremy Fitzgerald are both Freddy's performer. Fritz Smith and Mike Schmidt are both the single technician at Freddy's who got fired for the same reasons. William is back in security breach as Dave. Gregory somehow has a powerful connection to Freddy and no other robot. Dave left a message for Gregory in the sister location room, where both Michael and William have tread. Whether it's taking William's guard position in FNAF 2, tracing William's footsteps into the sister location facility, Owning the security logbook after William, or following William into the pizzaplex, Michael always seems to be following his father.
William and Michael are like renegade spies trying to fix Fazbear Entertainment from within. I believe Fritz Smith is also William. Fritz is a minimum wage temp who somehow knew how to enter the lockdown building and adjust the Afton robots for a custom night. Fritz Smith can translate to the Smith of Frederick or the Maker of Freddy, which would be William. Fritz Smith and Mike Schmidt have uncommon English-German name combinations and got fired for the same reasons of tampering and odor. Only Fritz and Schmidt can adjust the animatronics for a custom night in FNAF 1 through 4. They're both the single technician at Freddy's. And Mike Schmidt takes the hot seat in FNAF 1 when Michael is in a coma, Cassette Man is still missing, and Phone Guy is dead. So I believe Fritz Smith and Mike Schmidt are both aliases of William. Even in FNAF 1, the story must have had at least two killers. Shadow Freddy treats Mike slash William like he's guilty. But Nightmare devoured Phone Guy, then sent William a tape of her doing it. You could cast William as the guilty guard or Phone Guy's killer, but he doesn't fit in both roles at once. Someone else is out there. Back to FNAF 4. The bedroom is a memory of FNAF 1, with two doors to guard as Bonnie and Chica attacked from the same directions. Bonnie and Chica passed the open doors because they didn't want to kill you. But Nightmare now controls all of the robots, forcing them to attack. The plushies are Michael's friends and family, but the Fredbear plush isn't one of them. Shadow Freddy didn't only bite Michael. Each of the FNAF 3 Phantoms is missing body parts. Foxy lost an arm, Freddy lost a leg, and Chica only has two toes when she had three in FNAF 2. Nightmare bit off a piece of each of them, like how Yandere toy Chica collects favorite parts from her victims. Shadow Freddy uses this remnant link to control them. William returned to Freddy's in FNAF 3 to free the souls of the kids by smashing their robots, only to find Shadow Freddy still controlled them even in death. She used them to pin William in the secret room until a ghost who could enter it appeared. William dove into Barefoot Sprig Bonnie for cover, but Sammy slash Andrew already haunted it. So William became a prisoner for the next few decades. While Auntie Charlie mimicked the long-dead voice of her father, Phone Guy, and ordered all the secret rooms sealed at the variety of locations that existed at this point in the future. Springtrap already exists when FNAF 4 begins. Plush Trap is a miniature Springtrap, and Plush Trap Kids toy is already Springtrap Green. William is in this prison, too. FNAF 4 has three protagonists. William in Fun with Plush Trap, an echo of Save Them, Michael in 8-Bit Town, an echo of Both Bites, and Michael's older brother Phone Guy in the bedroom, an echo of FNAF 1, the last place he saw before Yellow Bear devoured him. These three are connected. If William defeats Plush Trap, Phone Guy gets two hours off his night. And if Phone Guy wins, Michael's story advances. William and Phone Guy continue their struggles even after Michael dies. FNAF 4 cannot be a mundane nightmare if three people are sharing it at once. But that wasn't the end of Michael. FNAF 4 transitions into FNAF World. And no matter who we put in our party, our overworld character is Michael's avatar, Freddy. Freddy visits Duskman, Old Man Consequences, and represents us in every glitch world except the third level where our avatar becomes a human face. Shadow Freddy still controls Fredbear and pretends to be our friend, pushing us toward a troll ending. But if we wait long enough, the second soul in Fredbear, the real Golden Freddy, takes over long enough to tell Michael about the clocks, the actual way out of this virtual prison. With Golden Freddy's advice, Michael arms all the happiest day minigames he'll use later in FNAF 3, then escapes through an up portal. In my notes, Michael wakes up as the endoskeleton inside Freddy in FNAF 2's cutscenes. The FNAF 1 building is opened again in some iteration, and his friends Sammy and Lamar notice he's back and are happy to see him. The Mangle Marauders are back together again. But Michael isn't alone. If you brighten the Freddy mask he's wearing, it turns purple. Shadow Freddy still controls Freddy, and Shadow Freddy is holding Michael prisoner inside Freddy the same way Shadow Bonnie holds William captive in Springtrap. The puppet finally rescues Michael, freeing his endo to go and get a new set of synthetic flesh. That's why Freddy's endoskeleton is missing in the FNAF 3 teaser. Freddy has no eyes, while Bonnie and Chica have theirs. Michael's endo is gone, so Freddy, like unpiloted Fredbear, appears empty. It took Michael a long time to face his fears and return to what used to be Fredbear's, the place where Fredbear dines on his family. But if he didn't, his father, his family, and Golden Freddy, the bright part of himself, would remain prisoners forever. So Michael gathered his courage and went to Fazbear's Fright. Michael created his own pain and horror when he locked out Charlie, so Michael had to make things right. Using the Happiest Day minigames, he summoned the other kids and gave J.J. Charlie, the ghost behind the table wearing the Fredbear mask, the birthday party she never got to have. 
Twins are a common theme in FNAF. Sammy and Charlie, BB and JJ, Golden Freddy and Shadow Freddy, Foxy and Mangle, Nightmare and the Puppet and their fusion knight Marion, and Sammy and William, two abused kids who shared the same minigame several times. Ghosts resemble their robots, and Sammy and William went into Spring Bonnie, so they both became a type of Shadow Bonnie. Sammy is the original dark silhouette from FNAF 2, but William is the purple Shadow Bonnie in Glitch. Sammy and William have a lot in common. They're both abused children who view the world through a warped lens. Both were innocent until rage and pain warped them into monsters, and each is both the victim and killer of the other. They stayed in the hate pretzel known as Springtrap for decades, but Balloon Boy, a nicer version of Sammy, showed William how to escape the box he was trapped in by phasing through the wall. So William left the box just like Balloon Boy did, and found the shadowy crying child guarding his prison then ended their decades-old battle by forgiving him and giving him cake. So Sammy joined Happy Estate to help his sister move on as well. FNAF is about fixing broken people. William was Mangle, who kept having to put himself together after everything he'd been through. Mangle even has a magician skin, like William's Security Beach robot, appropriate for the inventor of robotic horcruxes. Sammy had been angry for so long he didn't remember how to be otherwise, and the traumas Charlie suffered literally broke her in half. Shadow Freddy surrendered to a world full of rage and hate and tore everything apart while the puppet kept trying to put both of them back together. Michael finally redeemed himself by helping the puppet save Charlie, who forgave Michael and dropped her control to let everyone else move on. This is how the original Four Games One story of FNAF ended. The later games hail from the bad ending of FNAF 3 after the fire, and while Michael escaped Shadow Freddy's realm and freed William, one person didn't get a happy ending. Phone Guy. The Magenta Man. Because Ultimate Custom Knight is his special version of Hell. Creatures from FNAF World freely appear on the UCN desk. This place might look natural, but it's as virtual and fake as FNAF 4. We can visit Old Man Consequences directly, because we're trapped here in Shadow Freddy's FNAF World, too. Every character in UCN dislikes us except one. Ballora, Henry's wife, is so happy to see us she makes romantic overtures, which is weird if we're not a version of Henry. Don't be shy. These are strange circumstances that have brought us together. I could hear you breathing. Nightmare BB, Nightmare, and Nightmare Chica all remark on how small and bite-sized we are. You're not so big. Just a bite-sized morsel. I will vomit you back to relieve your horror. We literally fit into their mouths. The puppet says she isn't afraid of us. Not anymore. We're someone who was once big who's been cut down to size. A small fragment of a soul like baby Voldemort. Cassette Man, fourth closet Henry, has most of our remnant now. We're just a fragment of a memory of who he used to be. The puppet says she doesn't hate us, but why would she have reason to? The puppet trusted William and saved them. He wasn't her killer. But Henry had to send a killer bear robot after her in Pizzeria Simulator because the puppet didn't trust him. Now and then, we're haunted by the one you should not have killed. The grinning demonic face of a boy, equal parts red and green. Just like Red Shirt Balloon Boy and Green Shirt Plush Trap Kid from FNAF 4, two versions of Sammy. Phone Guy told himself he was doing what was best for his children, but he really should have asked first. After defeating every trial in UCN, we finally see where we are. Inside FNAF 1 Yellow Bear, where Phone Guy has been trapped since before FNAF 1 began. Nightmare makes the rules here. You can try using the Death Coin on Yellow Bear, but it isn't going to work. Shadow Freddy still holds Third Closet Henry prisoner and tortures him constantly, even if she hurts herself in the process, writhing like she's in pain. Revenge doesn't heal, it only causes more harm. The music in the background is named Void, as the constant cycle of revenge and counter-revenge consumes all enjoyment and meaning from existence, as Phone Guy and the daughter he loved slowly slip into the darkness together. I know it all seems like a fanciful tale, but it echoes throughout the Fazbear Fright books. Oswald saw an empty, haunted Spring Bonnie suit attack six kids, a suit that knew things only his father could know. It could mimic his dad but acted like an inversion, until he threw it back into the pit. After Yarg Foxy took over, the Lonely Freddies were second-class citizens in their own restaurant. They already had souls of their own since one of them swapped with Alec. 
an entity inside Fredbear devoured Devon, one of several victims lured in by Kelsey the new kid. But not before Devon looked inside and discovered this entity had curly black hair, just like Andrew and Cassidy. Since Andrew was in Spring Bonnie, this soul-devouring entity in Fredbear might be his twin. Stanley gets infested by a horde of Minirinas that tear off his flesh from within, just like Michael's experience in Sister Location. Sometimes there isn't room for one more. Julius couldn't control his slave exoskeleton at first, but after he got breaking wheeled into it, it became part of him thanks to the theory of living metal. It wasn't a spring suit, but still worked on the same principle. After he merged with it, Julius could control the robot and go after the guy who locked him in. At least when the remote control was off, the robot's programming didn't compel his actions. Fazbear Entertainment's pink mad science Fazgoo stole and repurposed the souls of an entire class. They didn't tell those kids everything. Jack is the angry purple-faced owner of a small, struggling pizza place until he falls into the puppet carver, which cuts his remnant in half. Purple Jack is suddenly a wholly positive and wonderful person, but Jack's negative remnant congeals into a pink, dark-eyed humanoid made of Fazgu, who then goes off to found Fazbear Entertainment. Rosie Porkchop devours Jessica and Brittany. Their bodies are obliterated, but their souls live together forever in Rosie, who uses their voices and memories. Rosie says, we are your ladies in waiting, because there are two souls inside her, but uses Jessica's voice since she's the dominant personality. Eleanor decides to become a good person, and uses the remnant she hoarded in her silver heart-shaped locket to heal dying kids instead of harvesting them. Because she's a different person now, she uses a different name. Jessica the Frail. Jessica let Charlie share her dorm room in the Twisted Ones, even though Charlie was the opposite of her in almost every way. Gregory wasn't alone when he left the Pizzaplex after finishing Princess Quest 3. Vanny turned away from her life of crime and followed him out. But because she was a different person, she wore a different outfit, and looked just like Jessica when she left the front door. The story goes on, but with knowledge of the past, we'll be able to understand the future. FNAF is a 1,000-piece jigsaw puzzle, and every piece has a purpose and a story to tell. Thank you for giving my theories a chance. Good night, everyone.